General Attorney General Patrick yeah. Morrissey. Have you ever dunked a basketball, Patrick, from the from the floor on the ten foot <laughs> rim, not the trampoline? <laughs> I, I have not dunked a basketball, so uh, I think that I always had these slow twitch muscles. That <laughs> <laughs> That's like jumbo shrimp, isn't it? <laughs> slow you know, twitch. I, I, I remember, so this probably won't surprise you, but I was an old cross-country runner uh, growing up, and I played, uh, I played tennis, and I uh, ran cross-country, so I could go a long, long distance, but... A speed wasn't the forte. Dude, what did you weigh in high school? Wow. I'll tell you what. Uh, I wrestled at 108 pounds my uh, sophomore year, and uh, I'll just say that I'm slightly larger than that now. <laughs> well, 108. No no grown man should be expected to weigh 108, first and foremost. That's, no, no. That's unless you're a victim of something as a grown man, no, you're not look, weighing uh, 108. I, it's, it's funny because when, you, uh, when you're playing sports when you're younger, I, I remember vividly – I. Look, I'm a sports fan across the board, whether it's baseball, football, uh, basketball. But I ended up uh, wrestling during basketball season. But, uh, you know, it's always great to get out and play. I mean, we, we have to keep encouraging that uh, going forward in West Virginia and across the country. But, no, I, I uh, interesting collection of sports, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, I think it's a great thing for young kids to do. Let me Let me ask you a quick tennis-related question. I tried playing pickleball a month or so ago, and I've, I've played a lot of tennis through my life. I love tennis. Did you have fun playing pickleball? Um, not really. No. I mean, it, it was okay. And I mean, I think if I, if I get into it, I'm hoping this winter when my Medicare season ends to get into it. But I found myself swinging and missing ball, low balls and balls on the side because I'm used to a longer racket. So my muscle memory is saying, okay, you're going to hit that, no problem, and then I miss it by half a foot. Are you sure that's not just being in your 50s now? I was going to say, and not, <laughs> not as flexible as you used to be. <laughs> these guys, these guys are the ageists. Can you believe that? No, I just, I was yeah. wondering, have you, have you tried pickleball and did you find the same thing, that it's just, the I, muscle I memory doesn't tried, work? Yeah, I haven't tried pickleball yet, but I definitely know what you're talking about because uh, even just playing tennis. So I used to play a lot growing up. And as you guys know, uh, I taught tennis and, and played and was an umpire. So uh, I used to be around it all the time. And, and imagine that you become the AG and you're not playing, you're not doing anything much. Your muscle memory does start to change a little bit, but uh, it's definitely a different sort of skill. But people love it because – they can go out there. Maybe they don't have to run as much, uh, but they still enjoy the racket sport. So I have people that swear by it, so mm -hmm. I, oh, I yeah. can't attest to it. Yeah, let me get very quickly. I have played a couple of times, John, and I had the same problem you did. I enjoyed everything, all the balls above the knees, but below the knees or the ankle level, I cannot get to him anymore. Anyway. It's just very frustrating. It, in your defense, Admiral, you're 84 years old. I'm 84 years of age, well, but, I, but I still feel fairly flexible except when I'm trying you, to hit a low pitch. You pit get ball. along well. You do. You get well, along I'm, well. I'm only 56, yeah. and I, I feel that I am discriminated against every day because the ground is far too low for me. <laughs> so when I've got to lean down even to pick up the balls, <laughs> playing pickleball, it's bad. Yeah. Hey, speaking of athletics, uh, throughout your term, uh, the last eight years of it, you've done the Game of the Week uh, Kids kick opioids project uh, and soon your term as ag will end will you attempt to keep this going as a, a potential governor if uh, if you should be successful in november you, you know what i would consider it one of the reasons why we set this up is because when i first took over there really was no drug fighting function that existed in the executive branch of state government and there was a lot of work that needed to be done so we ended up partnering with schools of uh, nursing, schools of pharmacy. We work with the legislature to introduce curriculum into the school to educate people about the, the drug problem. And we thought it was really good to get out in the community uh, in terms of the schools to be able to have some young people submit poems or draw uh, paintings and get engaged as to how the opioid crisis was impacting them and you know interestingly there was some criticism of that people said why are you bring young people into the mix and we responded that we thought young people were in the mix that they knew more about what was going on than anyone and that was important to do so we've we've done that uh, we had the opioid awareness games of the week where you try to find a rivalry game and you educate people about 
of the perils of legal pain pills. And we found some pretty interesting statistics along the way that a lot of the athletes were taking opioids when they could have been taking non-opioid alternatives. And as a result, they were much more likely to become addicted. So we were able to go in and educate a lot of people about that. And so, look, uh, whatever the program, we're going to continue doing a lot of big education work uh, out of the office. And I'm excited about that uh, because there's nothing more important than saving another generation from senseless death. Along that line, uh, Patrick, uh, is there uh, going into the uh, NI? If you are successful in, in the election, which uh, I think a lot of the numbers suggest you will be, uh, is there something that you would look at the governor role that's different than all of your predecessors? You've kind of alluded to it right now. Yeah, I, I, so I think the key thing that we'll be able to do, if I'm fortunate enough to uh, to get elected, and I would say to everyone listening. Also, uh, we're running statewide, we're running hard, and uh, yet this is the first time, I believe, in uh, it'll be over 100 years that the Eastern Panhandle is going to have an opportunity to have someone elected from this area. And I, I think that's important for people to understand. And uh, beyond the record of what we've done, I think it's always helpful for someone who has taken the time to get to know all parts of the state and is going to represent every county and every person effectively. But one thing that we're looking to do with respect to the drug epidemic that I don't think anyone's had an opportunity to do before is we're going to try to work with the counties, the cities, the West Virginia First Foundation, uh, the private sector, and the Fed to be able to come up to have comprehensive solutions to a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now. And uh, in the past, that really wasn't possible because, one, there wasn't a West Virginia First Foundation, and we weren't able to leverage the settlement resources that were out there. Two, there's a big uh, plan within the West Virginia First Foundation, the strategies to tackle the opioid epidemic. And so I think if we can uh, leverage the, uh, the resources of the governor's office and uh, bring people to bear coalition-wise, that's going to give us the ability to I think accomplish even more fighting the drug epidemic, and I'm excited about that. Plus, obviously, we're all watching and waiting to see what happens nationally. Uh, but if we're able to go in and work with uh, President Trump, I can envision a scenario where you're working with the federal government on a couple policies, such as making fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. You're doing partnerships with the counties, with the private sector, with the foundation, with the legislature on – uh, ways we can uh, take on this terrible crisis from a holistic perspective. So I do think that's going to be different. And obviously, education and prevention will be a big part of it. Patrick, you mentioned West Virginia first a couple of times. Of course, the model that we all look back on was the tobacco settlement. And, uh, and, and I think West Virginia and other states are kind of using that as a consideration to putting together the uh, the approach to this epidemic. Are you satisfied at this point in time the progress that West Virginia First has made? You know, I would say that uh, no one should ever be satisfied anytime there are still deaths that are occurring uh, from a particular problem. And so uh, that's certainly the case for the drug epidemic. And so uh, there should be no satisfaction until we protect everyone's life. I will say that I am hopeful um, that the pace is going to uh, pick up. I think you saw that the board let out uh, proposals, and so you're going to start to see them uh, pick some of the projects that will begin. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to uh, getting elected uh, as the next governor because one of the things we'll be able to do, <clears throat> I think, is to work closely with them and I think help move that along. Now, they're a private foundation, and we're not going to um, interfere in all of their decision-making, but I think there's a really unique opportunity uh, to work with them and help them perhaps move uh, at a, a different pace. But I think there are a lot of good people. I'm not going to be critical of them. I think you've got a great executive director of someone, uh, Jonathan Board, who's done some terrific things. And uh, I, I am optimistic long-term. I think the key is they they did 
did take a while for the executive director position to come together. You may recall that there was an individual we had, but then that person was not able to reach an agreement with the uh, the board. And so I think that's that's part of the, um, the the pace issue. But now we have an excellent executive director and a board that's committed, I think, to making this work. So I'm long-term very optimistic. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, our guest here on the program on October the 29th. You have agreed to debate the Democratic nominee, Steve Williams, who is uh, hoping to be the next governor of the state, uh, like you are. And according to the Metro News article, and the Metro News West Virginia poll they did in August showed you with a 49% to 35% lead over Williams. That's 14 points with uh, about 16 uh, points there undecided, kind of in the middle there, Patrick. What is your feeling going into this debate, and uh, will there be any other debates leading up to Election Day? Well, I would say that I, I believe that it's important to debate, and I know there were a lot of people saying, oh, well, will he or won't he? And there are people suggesting it's not in my interest uh, to debate because uh, people believe that we have a lead. And I've always rejected that notion, and I've always been consistent that the voters deserve a debate, and uh, I was eager to do that. And in every campaign, it's been the same. So I'm excited about it, and uh, I'm going to prepare and make sure that people have uh, transparency about the agenda that I try to bring to bear if I'm fortunate enough to get elected as the state's next governor. So uh, there is that debate. I'm not sure whether there will be uh, any other, but I wanted to make sure that there would, at a minimum, uh, be an opportunity for people to compare uh, the two folks that would have a chance of prevailing, and I think that's important. And I misspoke a moment ago about the 16%. Some of those prefer a third-party candidate. Some right now just haven't made up their mind, just to be clear about that remaining uh, 16%. What do you see as the primary differences between you and Steve Williams? You know, I, I would say worldview and philosophy. Uh, if you look at the issues that I focused on and what we're trying to do the state, I think that West Virginia needs someone who's going to be willing to really look closely at government to try to repurpose government uh, into the future, because we have a lot of changes in terms of how technology is evolving. And we need to have someone who's going to question every aspect of it and say, what is the best way to spend taxpayer dollars? And how do we make sure that taxpayer dollars are, func are focused on uh, governmental functions that prioritize the will of the people? And I think that's really critical. And uh, my worldview is I'd like to see government be smaller than my opponent. I'd like to make sure that we're turning more money back to the people. It's their money. It belongs to them. I think the other big difference is you're going to see a very aggressive approach on my end to try to help West Virginia compete better with the other states uh, that we touch and, uh, and to put coalitions together also to ensure that our natural resources are used uh, appropriately. But I've talked about it on this program and other places. Having that rigorous competition with uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania and Maryland and Virginia and Kentucky and looking for different ways that we can be superior to all those states on tax policy, on regulatory policy, workforce policy, licensing rules, to drive those workforce participation numbers up through the roof, that's going to be critical. And I'm the only one focusing on that. I, I, I'm not going to say anything bad about my opponent. I, I don't. Uh, I think he's a nice guy, and I have no interest in making this into kind of a personal squabble. Uh, but I, I will say that the worldview is going to be different. I, I would look at the other side as a, a much bigger government a style approach of someone who's very closely aligned with Kamala Harris, um, whereas I think that the experience I bring to bear – out of the AG's office has let me uh, work on a lot of the critical challenges of the day, albeit as the state's legal officer, because obviously they're different jobs. Uh, being the state's chief lawyer is different than being the state chief executive. But one thing it does is it allows you to get a really good bird's eye view into many of the problems that the state's facing. And that's why I think uh, I'm the only person that's going to be able to hit the ground running on day one to make sure we're beginning to solve a lot of the problems that we have here in West Virginia, 
but do it based upon the principles that I've been not only articulating but living by over the last 12 years. The legislature right now is examining a more moderate additional tax cut, Patrick, 2 percent instead of 5, and they're going to delay it 18 months uh, when they, it does eventually uh, kick in with the trigger and such. And it appears that in, in doing so, they are going to give whoever the next governor is a bit more leeway with the budget because you won't have to inherit somebody else's larger tax cut. You'll be able to do a bit more study on what's appropriate. Your thoughts on what's taking place in the legislature regarding that tax cut now? Well, first, I've always been a huge advocate of dramatically reducing the income tax. In fact, I, I think I was one of the first people to call for that long before they were considering it in the legislature. I, I remember um, writing about that way back in 2009 uh, when I was thinking about the different issues that could help West Virginia, uh, having certainly the lowest income tax of all the states that we touch, I think would be wildly beneficial for West Virginia. So, look, I applaud the overall direction people are going in. I think it's really positive. At the same time, I know that we're working really hard to make sure that uh, when we cut taxes, we're doing it and we're planning for the future. We're able to uh, be in a spot where we're paying for it. And uh, I think that's really critical. So I, I think what they did seems very reasonable. They they tried to give a little bit more flexibility so that when if I'm fortunate enough to get in there, I have an ability to do uh, auditing of everything that's occurring within state government and to evaluate uh, kind of the priorities of state government and, and try to make recommendations to the legislature about that and uh, make certain decisions that are going to make sure that we're uh, looking out for the people and their hard-earned tax dollars a little bit more. So, you know, I take no fault with uh, with that. I know that uh, I will say that uh, I think having massive numbers of bills right before the election, that's not a desirable thing, right? You know, that uh, it, I think things do benefit from having a, a process that you can look at bills, you can evaluate them, and you can make changes, especially when we're talking about uh, the size of government, the function of government, and uh, that benefits from the committee process, the research, the uh, testifying, and the things like that. That's certainly positive. And obviously, there are always going to be reasons why you move emergency bills, but I, I do think that uh, in January and February, when the legislative session starts uh, in 25, there's going to be an opportunity to really get some pretty big things done if people are interested. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Well, let me, uh, Patrick, let me, let me interject. You were, you were talking about us competing with the states we touch and how important that is, and I, I agree 100% with that. One way we are getting our butts kicked by the states we touch here in the eastern panhandle is we are losing teachers in droves because, unfortunately, especially, you know, Loudoun County, I think, is second or third in income in the country the Maryland counties, Virginia, is there going to be, are you going to be able to maybe move us toward being able to pay our teachers more? I know it's a, it's a dirty word here in the state locality pay, but our teachers are so underpaid compared to the teachers near us. I mean, I've got two or three teacher friends who've left in the last year and literally are driving 15 minutes farther to make 20,000 more. And I, I don't begrudge them that. I mean, they stayed as long as they could, but the bottom line is we are losing brain power. We are losing teachers. And one of the great things about the Eastern Panhandle is we are the economic engine that is driving the state because of the growth and the growth of higher incomes. And if our, if our education goes down, we will have less people moving here from Northern Virginia, Maryland, that are people with high incomes that are adding to our tax base if they can't educate their kids well. Is, is, have you, uh, what, do you have any thoughts on that? I do, and I think you're exactly correct, and I've pointed this out many a time because when you're competing with Loudoun County, which is, I believe, the wealthiest county per capita in the country right now, and you're talking about uh, the ability of another county to kind of come in and steal a lot of our teachers because they can just pay them so much more, we have to make adjustments on that, and I believe that firmly, and that's why I talk in terms of competing with the other states that we touch. I don't use that other phrase. I use the phrase that we're trying to be more competitive, and that's the only way that you win in a modern world, that you compete. And that means 
taking on the other states across the board. And uh, certainly in the educational realm, that's important. Also matters with respect to uh, first responders and law enforcement, where you hear similar type of problems. So there are some issues that we're going to have to really focus on and make some tough decisions. And I'm, I'm very up for that uh, to make sure that we can compete more, because if we don't start to really move the needle from an educational perspective, you're right. We're not going to advance. Now, I do think we can, and there are opportunities, especially with the advent of Hope Scholarship, where people can come into West Virginia and have an opportunity to get uh, a better education, and they're going to get some of their uh, their needs, their financial needs addressed in a way that they may not in other states. I think that certainly helps. But your point about the teachers is correct, and uh, we are looking at that. Bill? Yeah, uh, let me shift gears. Uh, we're out, we're in election season where there's uh, in a highly polarized country. Uh, people are on edge. People are looking with a scance at the other side. Uh, the last, uh, uh, recently, there's a House Concurrent Resolution 203 that basically says if the, uh, if, uh, uh, the Republicans lose, West Virginia should consider succeeding from the nation. Of course, that will never happen. But this rhetoric, does that help us at all at this point in time, Patrick? Look, uh, I really don't know much about the yeah. resolution. I can just say this, that I'm focused. I'm running my race uh, to uh, be the next governor of the state of West Virginia. And uh, I'm hopeful, very hopeful, that uh, President Trump is going to prevail uh, I've been a big supporter of President Trump, and so I, I don't know all the details uh, that you're referencing, but I can say this. Uh, we're always going to be doing our job and acquitting ourselves, right, and not be afraid to tell the truth of what's going on. Uh, but I, I'm focused right now to make sure that um, I have a good chance of prevailing and that also uh, we have a chance to make sure that we're going to do everything we can to elect good people uh, across the board for all positions, for House, for Senate, and certainly for President, and I think that's important. So I mean, if, if we seceded, we'd be like Luxembourg, you know, stuck in the <laughs> middle of everybody. <laughs> but look how that much is, money they're making. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that is. Uh, we're not going to secede. Yeah, no, I, we're, I'm just being. I'm just being silly. I, I mean, I, I mean, when you hear people say stuff like that, it's like, why? What is? What is the purpose of being? You know, that far beyond the the pale of of anything sensible. Hey, about a minute left, Patrick. Are you back in the Eastern Panhandle anytime soon? You know, I was just back until uh, yesterday, and I left to come back to uh, to Charleston. And I will be back. I'll be at the Apple Harvest uh, Parade in Martinsburg uh, coming up. I believe that's in a little less than two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I'll be back again after uh, being around uh, this weekend. There was a grand opening uh, for uh, the Republicans in Jefferson County that I attended on Sunday. And so it's uh, been nice to spend some time and you know, we're trying to do a lot of campaigning in the Eastern Panhandle. I think that's really important. It's a unique opportunity uh, to elect someone from the Eastern Panhandle uh, to the governor's position and have someone uh, who can really do some incredible things. I feel very fortunate and humbled that I've had the opportunity to serve as the state attorney general. And I think the matchup against my opponent is, is strong. If I look at that, uh, that's a, a very different worldview in terms of the role of government in people's lives and in terms of aligning with a lot of the far left causes and so that's why I'm, I'm hopeful that people will look and say see the name patrick morrissey i believe we're first on the ballot so people can look at the first name and and stop and and hopefully uh, punch the ticket and on that note we are out of time have a great day sir thanks so much Appreciate thank you it. sir thanks patrick